Good afternoon and salam alaikum. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here at the Rumi Forum, an organization which, as you know, is very much dedicated to communication uh, between cultures and across cultural um, barriers on issues of um, social and political and economic interest uh, to the Washington community. Um, I'm from the Middle East Institute and formerly from the U.S. State Department. And uh, for that reason, um, uh, perhaps I'm particularly delighted to be able to have the honor to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, the U.S. Uh, Special Envoy to the Organization of International Conference, um, uh, Mr. Rashad Hussein. Um, Ambassador Hussein will be uh, speaking to you about some of the uh, experiences he's had in the administration. Um, he's had a, um, a short, since he's very young, <laughs> but distinguished career already uh, working in the White House, uh, in, in the office of the um, uh, associate counsel, where, among other things, he helped, he worked on President Obama's uh, speech of one year ago in Cairo uh, to the Muslim world. He also worked in the Department of Justice, um, on the staff of the Senate of the House Judiciary Committee in the Congress, and as a clerk uh, to a uh, justice in the U.S. Circuit Court. Um, as a result, he's worked in all three branches uh, of the U.S. government, and he had excellent preparation for this, um, thanks to his university studies, first in North Carolina then at Harvard, where he obtained two master's degrees, and then at Yale, where he graduated with a Juris Doctorate. Um, Ambassador Hussein, uh, the floor is yours, you. and I'm sure that this audience will be very interested to hear your views. Well, thank you so much, and thank you to the Rumi Forum for hosting this event and other events, and uh, it's really fascinating to hear about the work of the, of the Rumi Forum and uh, everything that's going on internationally. Uh, there's a special connection to Turkey, uh, which is one of my favorite places, Istanbul being one of my favorite cities. Uh, I visited there a number of times, uh, not in the capacity of a, uh, as envoy, but uh, hope to be visiting there soon. And as you know, as one of the, I was pointed out to me that I need to visit soon because it was one of the place, first places that the president visited when he went to Ankara and uh, really uh, began the dialogue that continued in Cairo and has continued since then. So. Uh, I'd like to give uh, kind of a brief overview of the administration's approach to engaging Muslim communities around the world, uh, go through um, the President's uh, remarks and commitments in Cairo and the framework in Cairo, and then talk a little bit about uh, the progress that's been made over the last year. As you all know, uh, the commitment to engaging Muslim communities around the world was uh, one that began uh, really uh, uh, in the President's uh, inauguration address where he uh, uh, was the first President to reach out specifically to Muslim communities around the world. And on his first day in office, he began to address uh, some of the issues um, that have been sources of tension between the United States and Muslim communities around the world, namely uh, signing executive order to ban torture, um, making it uh, clear uh, uh, by law that that practice is no longer uh, permitted, and also uh, signing executive order to shut down Guantanamo Bay. Uh, on his second day in office, the President addressed um, an issue that continues to be um, uh, one of the major issues that is often discussed uh, in our travels and uh, is, has been a focus of much attention, specifically in the last uh, month, month or so, even in more attention than usual, uh, which is the Middle East conflict. Uh, and on, the second, on his second day in office, the President appointed Senator Mitchell to be his envoy uh, to, the, to the region. And this is, I think, significant in the sense that uh, the President saw it as an immediate priority, and the President has really given uh, the administration uh, a long, a period of time to to work through the difficulties that will inevitably arise on this issue. Uh, it wasn't the case that you know he waited you know, months in the administration or years in the administration or till the end of a term 
or till a second term to deal with this issue, but really to uh, understand the importance of, uh, of this issue uh, and, and to convey that uh, appointed Senator uh, Mitchell uh, as one of, his, one of his first acts really as president. The first interview that the president gave uh, after coming uh, into office was with Al Arabiya, where he began to um, the, the the dialogue that well, well he continued the dialogue that began uh, in, on inauguration day and talked about uh, his commitment in these areas. And then, as I uh, just mentioned, on his first trip, the last uh, leg of that trip uh, that the president made, his first international trip, uh, he stopped in Ankara, where he. Uh, talked not only about our relationship uh, bilaterally with Turkey and our strong and important relationship that we have, uh, but also the uh, United States um, efforts and intention to have a continuing dialogue with Muslims around the world. And he made clear in Ankara that the United States, of course, is not at war with Islam or Muslims. And actually, the President added, in fact, that the United States uh, is not and will never be at war with Islam Muslims to make, a, to make it very clear, a declaration that that is not the policy of the United States, that is not how to interpret uh, decisions that have been made with regard to foreign policy, and that going forward there would be a continuous attempt, a comprehensive attempt to engage Muslim communities around the world. And then the President of course gave his uh, landmark address in Cairo. And there's three categories of areas that that I'll talk about that I think are, are significant from Cairo. These are three very broad areas, of course. Inevitably, there'll be some left out that don't fit quite uh, neatly into these categories. But the first category was really to uh, reformulate uh, relations with Muslim communities around the world in a way that creates a comprehensive framework that doesn't engage Muslims just based on one issue or one political conflict. So for example, uh, not engagement of issues shouldn't be just securitized around the issue of violent extremism or simply focused on the conflict in the Middle East, but the relationship as the President outlined in Cairo should be one that is comprehensive. And I'll get to that a little bit more in a second, but the President importantly uh, began uh, uh, a discourse in which he recognized the contributions that Muslims have made to global civilizations. And actually, you know, there's you know, the, the word co contributions is not quite fair because it's so much more than that. The Muslim communities have been an integral part of uh, uh, global civilizations, you know, obviously form one-fourth of the world's populations approximately. But he talked about the contributions that uh, Muslims have made in the United States. He talked about uh, the history of the dialogue between the United States and Muslim communities around the world, the fact that Morocco was the first uh, nation to recognize the United States as independence. And he talked about his own personal experiences growing up, hearing the, the, call, the, the call to prayer, the azan, and also his experiences in Chicago, where the Muslim communities there had played uh, such an instrumental role in, 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 in the communities in which he lived in community development. The president also made clear, uh, of course, that on the issue of violent extremism, that Islam is actually part of the solution and not part of the problem. And once again, making that declaration that the United States is not at war and never will be at war with Islam Muslims. So that category of, uh, I guess you could say, discourse, um, some people have described as kind of an educator-in-chief kind of role, where the president reframed uh, the discussion, reframed some of the rhetoric, the way that these issues are cast in, in creating a broad framework. And he wanted to make clear that you cannot engage one-fourth of the world's populations based on uh, the, f the, the beliefs of a fringe few. So the relationship must be much broader than dealing with just the issue of uh, violent extremism or other security issues. And, and that's why the president, and I'd say this is the second broad category of issues uh, to recognize coming out of the Cairo speech, is that our engagement should be uh, not just based on violent extremism or the political issues, but should be broad and uh, we should create partners, partnerships based on areas of wh what we call mutual interest, mutual respect, and mutual responsibility. And that stems from the recognition that people all over the world, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim, whether they live in a Muslim country or a non-Muslim country, they all share the same fundamental aspirations. If you survey people and you say, what's most important to you right now, uh, whether it's in Cairo, whether it's in Kansas, you, the answer that they'll probably give you is jobs. And so to really make sure that economic issues, entrepreneurship are a strong basis of our engagement. Uh, you know, people will talk to you about the importance of education, the importance of their uh, 
their, their, their children to be able to get a good education, the importance of access to health care. So to really engage people all around the world based on these issues that all people share in common. And that's a long-term strategic vision and has uh, created a number of partnerships in the area of education, entrepreneurship, health, science, technology, um, interfaith dialogue, just to name a, a few of the areas. Finally, the third uh, category, and last but not least, of course, and in fact, these are some of the first issues that the president addressed in the Cairo speech are the major political issues that have been sources of tension between the United States and Muslim communities around the world. And often, uh, when we travel, we hear uh, over and over again that really it's not, you know, we, we love Americans, there's, there's, you know, there's no problem between us and we want to come to the United States, we want to study in the United States, we want to seek employment in the United States. Sometimes the tensions have been due uh, to uh, differences in uh, opinion regarding foreign policy. And the President was very frank about the fact that, uh, uh, and the administration is very frank about the fact that there's always going to be some disagreements and there's no way to fully resolve every uh, f f difference in foreign policy uh, and views on, on foreign policy. But there are areas which the administration uh, is working towards that uh, we believe are in the interest of uh, people all around the world. And that, in that includes the conflict in the Middle East, of course, the ongoing efforts in Afghanistan and Pakistan um, and Iraq and Iran. So the major foreign policy issues that continue to be sources of tension along with the issue of violent extremism, along with the issue of democracy, um, uh, issues, of, uh, issues specifically um, affecting uh, women that the President uh, talked about uh, in the Cairo speech as being kind of the, the, the third area of uh, political tensions and, and other related issues. So those are kind of the three broad categories of, uh, of areas that the President mentioned in Cairo's speech. And uh, just to go a little bit further into the first area, the area where the, the President has kind of um, reformulated the way that these issues are discussed and has, I think, uh, may, the administration has made significant progress in the way in the, which these issues are framed, the rhetoric that's used. The president then um, at the beginning of Ramadan gave uh, a video presentation which is still available online <coughs> where you'll, you'll see that he uh, provided in, in, in some respects, some people have even called it uh, like a tutorial type. I don't think that's what it quite was. It was just recognizing the importance of Ramadan to Muslims where he talked about uh, the origins of the month, why Muslims fast, why those values are consistent with the, with the values that other people of other faiths have. Uh, he mentioned uh, that, the, that it was a month in which the Quran was revealed, that the first word that was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, was Iqra. Um, and so you really continued kind of that education role. And that uh, uh, also was the same case uh, when the president uh, had a statement on Eid and then at the beginning of Hajj when he talked about the importance of, of, of Hajj and why uh, this is a practice that, again, uh, is rooted in the, in the, in the, in the beliefs uh, systems of all, uh, of, of, of many of the major uh, religious faith of people around the world. Consistent with that approach, uh, the administration has also made sure to engage domestic uh, Muslim uh, communities uh, here, right here in the United States. And as a part of that, um, last July, uh, the president sent one of his uh, closest advisors, Valerie Jarrett, to speak at the largest gathering of American Muslims. And it's, in fact, one of the largest uh, conferences of Muslims anywhere in the world, the Islamic Society of North America conference, where she went through many of the aspects of, of the President's Cairo speech and also talked about the contributions in many areas of American Muslims. The President also sent uh, his most senior um, counterterrorism advisor, John Brennan, to speak at the Islamic Center at NYU, where he outlined uh, the administration's uh, positions in, in, uh, in, in the national security uh, area, including many uh, areas which affect Muslim communities here in the United States and around the world. And again, in the kind of education role and kind of the reshifting and the reformulating of rhetoric and the framework, uh, at that, uh, in, during that speech and then in John Brennan's later speech at the Center for Strategic and Na uh, International Studies, where he outlined the, 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 uh, the new national security strategy, uh, the President's uh, counterterrorism advisor made clear that terms such as Islamic terrorism uh, that have used in the past or um, jihadists, for example, those types of terms uh, can be unproductive in the sense that uh, Islam rejects terrorism. So to say uh, Islamic terrorism uh, is really kind of an unproductive thing and gives the label 
uh, the dignified label of Islam to those people that would want to do something that's against Islam. And this is something that's actually a point that's been made frequently by the Prime Minister of Turkey as well. And he, he made the same type of analysis uh, about the term jihadist as well. S and consistent with that, um, uh, with those uh, parts of our domestic engagement and the need to have a new framework and a new comprehensive approach uh, domestically here in the United States, the White House has been in, in, in constant communication with Muslim communities around the country, not just uh, on issues regarding national security and civil liberties um, and visas and TSA regulations and the types of things that have typically been the basis of dialogue in the past, but also on issues such as health care, where American Muslim physicians have been consulted, on issues such as immigration, uh, education, social issues such as the President's Fatherhood Initiative. There was a major um, uh, national, there was a major um, national campaign uh, for community service, the United, United We Serve campaign, which Muslim Americans all across the country uh, played a major role. So there's been a, a recognition, understanding that here in the United States too, that there, there should be a fundamental f uh, shift in that framework in a way in which Muslims are engaged, not just on the basis of one or two issues, but the, the, the engagement should be abroad. And really, a lot of this has occurred in the face of um, uh, oftentimes criticism by those who say, what do you really get out of this engagement? You know, there's still cases of uh, domestic radicalization that are occurring. There's still attempted terrorist attacks. There are still terrorist attacks. Uh, after the Fort Hood massacre, for example, um, you know, the president again made clear um, that these types of acts are something that are, are, are acts that are rejected by not only Islam, but by people of all faith. And when he was speaking at the, U, U, at the, at the memorial service for those uh, that were murdered um, in Fort Hood, he made it clear that this is something, uh, th these types of acts are, are something that uh, are frowned upon and rejected by uh, all faiths and that the person that committed these acts will receive justice in this life and the next life. And again, after the attempted attack on December 25th, the president uh, made that point and also made the point that, look, we are in this fight together, people all around the world, and in fact, the, the largest victims of terrorism, and there's statistics on this, 80%, 85%, 90% of victims of terrorism are actually Muslims. And you know, it's oftentimes the case that people point towards uh, these types of attacks and extremism, and they try to make arguments about how you know, if certain foreign policies of governments were, were different, or if this policy had been as such, or, you know, un or other policies had been different, then you know, maybe these types of attacks wouldn't be occurring. And people try to really pin, on, pin uh, down oftentimes certain excuses, but if you really look at the numbers, then you'll see that oftentimes there's attacks in which other Muslims are killed. You know, for example, after Friday prayers, there's, a recent, there's been you know, recent events in, in Pakistan where that has been the case. How can you look at uh, the foreign policy grievance that a person may have about the United States or any other country and then use that to justify killing other Muslims? And I think that really uh, goes to the, the strong point that, that uh, this is something, this ideology is something that extends uh, far beyond any one particular grievance. And the President made clear in his remarks after December 25th that it's actually Muslims that are, have been the largest victims of it. And again, after the, the recent attempts in Times Square and the President spoke to military graduates uh, at, at West Point, uh, he again made clear that these attempts should not be used uh, or should not have the effect of, uh, or the impact of dividing um, America and Muslim communities around the world. In fact, said that was impossible because Americans have been such uh, large contributors to, uh, Muslims have been such large co uh, contributors to American society generally. So this uh, engagement has occurred and continued in a consistent manner uh, despite uh, some of these at attacks and events that have, have occurred, not because of some of those events. I think in the past, uh, we've seen situations in which engagement has occurred because of certain events. And it's only after these events where the Muslim community is really consulted and brought in, and almost as a way of saying, you know, help us deal with this problem. But I think in this administration, we've seen that it's occurred despite that, that, we, that we've had a broad agenda of engaging these communities, and that engagement will not 
uh, cease to exist because of because uh, of, uh, because you know terrorists and and uh, and, and individuals and groups uh, have the agenda of, of you know murdering innocent people and. Uh, you know, th these are events that y you know have occurred, but the administration has continued uh, to um, emphasize that they are rejected by Islam, and that the uh, agenda of engaging and working and partnering with these communities must continue. So, to go into a little bit more specific uh, on the second category, uh, which I mentioned, which is the the partnerships. Um, I mentioned education, and in that area. Uh, Engagement uh, has increased uh, specifically by increasing exchanges by uh, approximately 30 percent. And really, there's this is a this is um, an approach in these areas of partnership, which is not just occurring out of the White House or the State Department, but uh, really all federal agencies and departments have been involved, whether it's the USAID or the Commerce Department or the Department of Labor or the Small Business Administration or the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and oftentimes what happens is there's so much going on in these areas that um, there's uh, many initiatives that I may not even immediately know about or everyone in the government may not immediately know about. There's an interesting um, exchange program in addition to the, the, the uh, the general increase in exchanges that I learned about uh, between NASA and Arab youth, for example, that's very much consistent with the spirit of the Cairo's speech, and um, other exchange programs uh, that have increased as well. Uh, in the area of uh, entrepreneurship, the president mentioned in, in, in Cairo, <coughs> committed in Cairo to hosting a uh, presidential summit on entrepreneurship, which we held here in Washington a couple of months ago, uh, speaking with the entrepreneurs um, uh, here and then also visiting with some of them abroad, it seems to have been an excellent experience. It was uh, we, we actually have gotten some complaints uh, from uh, when I've been traveling uh, from the from government officials who said, "How come we weren't uh, invited?" And we said, well, "It's because this was an event for the actual entrepreneurs, and the entrepreneurs um, got together and discussed th some of the challenges that they face at home to entrepreneurship, some of the uh, some of the barriers and some of the creative solutions that they've been able to come up with." There was a Palestinian student there. Um, that was actually offered a, s a scholarship by a major business school, uh, by the dean of a major business school in the United States at that event. And, th and those are the types of stories that I think many of the entrepreneurs took back home with them in addition to contacts uh, for others around, with others around the world and ideas for how to foster that growth, to how to f uh, on how to foster entrepreneurship. And really, uh, it, it brought a lot of attention to the need to create conditions uh, that are that make entrepreneur that facilitate entrepreneurship and and uh, make entrepreneurship a much more viable in many of these countries. And the, the Prime Minister of Turkey has, off has offered to host a follow-up summit next year, and there are other regional summits that are being planned. And we think that this is an important initiative for uh, facilitating uh, economic uh, economic growth. And um, we had you know entrepreneurs from uh, approximately 60 countries, I believe, many of them Muslim majority countries. Uh, we, there, was a, there was entrepreneurs of all faiths, there was entre entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs from Israel there as well. And really, uh, we were uh, uh, very impressed that uh, the entrepreneurs there were really focused on uh, the task at hand um, and not so much distracted by oftentimes the, the issues that get a lot of play and a lot of attention, the more political issues, but to really focus on working with one another to address uh, the issues that were the agenda of that conference. In the area of health, uh, we have a partnership with the Organization of the Islamic Conference for the Eradication of Polio. And uh, just in the last year, in many of the uh, polio endemic countries, the numbers have come down tremendously. Uh, the four polio endemic countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nigeria, and India, three of them, of course, are Muslim majority countries. And in the fourth country, India, it's l majority Muslim populations that are affected in UP and Bihar. And uh, through this partnership, uh, I was in, for example, Nigeria, a couple of months ago, and during the first quarter of the year, there was only three new cases uh, that were reported, which was a tremendous decline from the previous year. So it's an area that we w that we're working on. We think is important. It's it's an issue that is that it can be addressed if the attention uh, proper attention is given. It's a it's a disease that results in disability and death, and it's an important area for partnership. Also in the area of health, we had a partnership with the Saudi uh, ministry, health ministry on H1N1 before Hajj mm. uh, last year. There was a, it was at the height of the uh, H1N1 uh, um, 
season, and there was concern that uh, there could be an outbreak there amongst the Hujjaj, and then also uh, that it could spread back to home countries when the pilgrims traveled back home. And so uh, there was a successful partnership in which HHS and uh, the Center for Disease Control were involved. Um, uh, and it was another example of you know, <coughs> cooperating on areas of uh, mutual interest. Uh, the, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, just to give you an example of how so, much, uh, so many aspects of the government are involved in this work, uh, Kathleen Sebelius traveled to the World Health Assembly. I, I, was, I actually traveled with her, and uh, we had a meeting with OIC health ministers there. And uh, that was focused on the polio issue and also maternal child health, the, the, global, the administration's global health initiative, and really facilitating our partnerships in that area. Um, in the area of science, and technology. We've had our science uh, envoys traveling throughout the region and recently given uh, recommendations on establishing further partnerships in the area of science. Ahmed Zawail, uh, a Nobel Prize winner, and uh, Elias Zerhouni and, and Bruce Alberts who have had tremendous success in their travels uh, throughout the region. We've also established a global uh, technology and innovation fund which will invest potentially three to three and a half billion dollars in uh, technology projects in um, in, in, in Muslim-majority countries and other uh, parts of the world. Uh, and in the last area that I mentioned, interfaith dialogue, uh, there's been a number of initiatives, a major conference in Jakarta, um, a working group that's uh, focused on uh, re re the role of re religion in global affairs that's evaluating many of the interfaith um, uh, initiatives that are occurring around the world, mapping those and tracking those and seeing which types of things are successful, how the government uh, can be involved, you know, which place in which areas is best for the government not to be involved, and also uh, the organization of a, of a conference on the role of interfaith and development that will be occurring uh, within the next year. So those are some of the initiatives, and there's many others. On the White House website, there is a New Beginnings uh, section. Uh, in which you can see uh, many of the initiatives that have been seeded over the last uh, year or so since the Cairo speech. And we really think that these are important for the long term to, to continue uh, to mac in, a, in a way which we can maximize uh, prosperity, so to speak, when there are resolutions uh, to, the, to, the, to the many areas of political tension uh, that the President talked about in the Cairo speech. And so that, that being the third category, I'll address some of those now. I briefly mentioned the Middle East conflict. This is an area where uh, you know, obviously there's been ups and downs it's, uh, over the last 60 years, and it's an area that will require persistence, um, but, it's, but it's an area that the, an issue that the President has committed over and over again uh, to, uh, to working on, being persistent on. He ad again made that clear at the Entrepreneurship Summit, again made that clear uh, a couple weeks ago when President Abbas was here. And uh, I know that there's been difficulties, but Senator Mitchell has been in the region um, uh, constantly since he was appointed. And uh, we have had uh, proximity talks that are underway, and, and the, uh, the goal is for those to lead to neg direct <coughs> negotiations as soon as possible so that we can work towards the, the two-state solution. And the, you know, the recent events uh, that, that have occurred um, have really uh, galvanized energy towards making sure that we work toward that as soon as possible. Because you know, as the President and the, and the Secretary have said, the, the, the humanitarian situation uh, is one that's, that's, that's unsustainable. And the types of events that occurred are best averted by coming up with a long-term solution. And, and that's one that the administration will work towards. And I think you know, just like you saw on the issue of health care, where people said, forget about it. They've been working at this. They've been trying for this for 70 years. Every President has tried to do it. And it hasn't happened. And you know, there's no way the president is going to be able to get it through, uh, particularly in light of you know recent uh, political events and the change in the numbers and the makeup of Congress is just dead in the water now. It's not going to happen. And I think that that was an example of an issue that the president really cared about and continued to push through on, and eventually um, led to uh, success in that area. And I, and I very very much see this issue as the same. And of course, there'll be ups and downs, and it'll take time. But I think you'll see that uh, um, y y we won't use. Um, events like the ones that recently occurred as a way of uh, walking away uh, from what's going on there and then we'll really continue to, to work towards a solution. In the area of um, uh, the, the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, I think particularly with uh, Iraq, I'll speak about first, um, this was, this is an area where uh, the administration really um, has, ha has done exactly what the President 
uh, has said we would do um, in, the, uh, in the, the commitments that he made in the campaign. Um, at the end of last month, the number of troops, combat troops, is down to 90,000. At the end of next month, uh, it will be down to 50,000. And we're on track uh, to transfer power responsibly back over uh, and to be out of Iraq by the end of next year. And I think, you know, there's been a recent election there in the formation of government. Um, this issue has not, uh, you know, gotten quite as the level of attention as in the previous administration where it was a major issue and the, perhaps the number one issue uh, that was uh, discussed when uh, we talked about relations between the United States and Muslim communities around the world. So I think it's really an area where we see progress and also in Afghanistan where a similar, um, uh, where similar efforts uh, are being made and uh, I think there's a uh, good amount of success in, in sticking to uh, the timeline, so to speak, of, uh, of our engagement there and transferring power over uh, r responsibly. Um, so those are, you know, some of the areas that I wanted to touch on in terms of the three major categories of the general shift in framework <coughs> and the shift in rhetoric, the shift in tone, uh, which I think, you know, that category in itself, that's something that has to occur. When you're thinking about a long-term uh, shift um, in the way that these issues are dealt with, I think everything starts there and the amount that's been done in I think that first area uh, really has uh, been r remarkable in the, in the way that um, relations have turned around. With that, of course, has come tremendous expectations with what the President uh, uh, said in Cairo in his landmark speech and uh, we understand that with those uh, expectations there will inevitably be, um, you know, whether you're looking at a benchmark of one year, there's inevitably going to be some disappointment that um, you know, despite what's gone on in terms of these partnerships and the steady progress on the political issues, that um, it's th that it's not going to occur fast enough. And if everyone would like to see it move even faster than it has, um, and even more progress in these areas. But I think that uh, what what you'll see is that now that this vision has been put in place and execution is well underway, that we'll reach a point in the administration where we can look back and say that power has been transferred on the political issues, power has been transferred successfully in Iraq and Afghanistan, that we've gotten to a breakthrough or close to a breakthrough on the Middle East issue. At the same time, we fundamentally changed the rhetoric and the tone and the framework of dealing with Muslim communities and that it's a comprehensive engagement now. And there's been a number of programs seated in areas of mutual interest and mutual respect, education, entrepreneurship, health, science and technology, uh, interfaith dialogue and others that, are, that really form the basis for a strong relationship going forward. So that is uh, where uh, I, uh, I see uh, uh, the things uh, approximately one year after the Cairo speech. Hopefully, um, th that's uh, an honest assessment. I know there'll be there there'll be areas of uh, agreement, and there'll be some areas of, of disagreement in terms of policy and 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 the way things have gone, and satisfaction with the speed at which it's gone. But this uh, again is uh, these are all areas which uh, the administration will continue to be persistent on, and we will continue to see uh, progress over the next years. Thank you. Thank you.